presentation this evening of our uh, our trip that we took to Turkey and Greece and really around the Medi it's the Mediterranean Sea but they like to call it the Aegean Sea there they have uh, a myth to go along with it there's a myth to go with everything in Greek culture and uh, I want to I guess the battery must be dead. I've turned this on several times and it's not working. Luke, but yeah, he pranked me. So, um, I want to just give you some takeaways of some things that uh, which we were able to learn as we made our trip, and it was a very enriching trip. There's just something very, very special as anyone who has visited any of the places in which you read about uh, geographically accounts, uh, things happening where God worked. And then getting to go and stand in the same place, in the very place where those things happen, is something that's very, very special. And so, one of the things that I um, feel inadequate to do, though, this evening, I'll just tell you right in advance, is to do any sort of justice to the things that you see with your eyes. I remember when I was in seminary, I was in a number of, uh, not in the hurricanes, but worked in a number of the hurricane areas. And one of the things that you realize when you see a disaster is that you can take a picture of something that's a snapshot of something. Like a, it's, it's a microcosm in the whole disaster. For instance, I remember driving the 180 miles of devastation along the Gulf Coast of Katrina. And if you think about the time frame, if you're going 60 miles an hour or so, three hours of devastation, three hours of driving, and the whole time going, whoa, look at that. Oh man, can you, can you believe that? Oh wow! Oh wow! Uh, you know, the whole time it's 180 miles of that. I remember in uh, Hurricane Katrina a couple things, and I hope I've got pictures somewhere of this. I don't know where they're at, but I did. I used to have pictures of uh, a Chevy Camaro like just slammed into the ground up to its windshield, just like you know. And it's like, how do you shoot a car into the ground like that? It was looked like it was just parked in the ground like this up to its windshield. And then another time we past an area in Gulfport where a concrete slab home had been and there was nothing but the foundation just the slab like it was freshly poured and then there was a toilet sitting on the slab and then what made it humorous was one of those um, light up Santa Clauses that they put in the lawns for Christmas time just sitting there on the slab and it didn't blow away I, you just wonder like how did that get there <laughs> you know how did something cheap and plastic and how did a porcelain toilet survive perfectly and then everything else is gone. Another, another place, and I used to have a picture of, was the uh, two-story house. Well, the first story was completely gone, but the second floor was just sitting where the first floor was. So it's a house with no doors. It's like the second floor windows, you know, but it's just sitting, you know, obviously not perfectly, but pretty, pretty uh, well presented. And so one of the things that I will say is that, uh, one, I'm afraid I'm going to elaborate too much on some of the photos that we see this evening because every single one of these photos represents an experience, represents uh, things that I could, I just couldn't possibly share with you. I have thousands of photos. It's very, very complicated. So one of the things I mainly did this evening was, I guess, kind of try to give you a taste. So it's the Asian Sea, and of course that's the Mediterranean. It's the upper part of the Mediterranean mythological story behind it is that one of the gods, I think, threw something in the water and made a dark, dark blue ink or something, and they Asians blue, deep blue, and that's a color. So Melissa can probably remember the story better than I can, but I don't uh, think a lot about mythology. But let me stop there and just discuss that part. One of the things that we were impressed a lot about uh, with the Greek culture, one of the things that we just recognized over and over and over again is the value of myths, the value of mythological battles, mythological occurrences to the nation's identity and history. Uh, and the only way I could put it would be like this. Now, in many ways, Greek culture, because it's a democracy, uh, would have a lot of similarities of being kind of a melting pot of people. For instance, the people group who inhabit Greece today are very Greek culturally, but they would not have been the original Greeks who built out, and, and we were part of the uh, descendants of Philip and uh, Alexander who built out the Greek Empire. But they are very, very proud Greeks. They're very, very proud of being Greek, even though they wouldn't be those original people groups. And it would just be like being proud to be an American, where you came to be part of this country and you became assimilated into this country. 
And so the, the thought processes, the Greek way of thinking is something that even the Romans really largely assimilated. Much of the Roman Empire, of course, you know that a lot of the language that the Romans used and didn't get do away with uh, would have been the Greek language. And so uh, they, also, they also kept the education, the learning of the Greeks, and they kept, of course, all of the idols of the Greeks. So the Greek history remains pretty intact, pretty largely intact, and that impressed us quite a bit. But what really impressed us was that even today, the Greek people value the myth on the level of historical accuracy. In other words, many times Greek people are saying, well, this is the myth of what happened in such and such battle. And, uh, well, we think, you know, obviously that couldn't have happened exactly that way, but we kind of accept it, and, you know, that's part of our history, and that's just what we believe. And to which I'm like, well, did it happen or didn't it happen? If it didn't happen, it's bunk. It doesn't mean it, it doesn't amount to a hill of beans to me if it's fake. But if it's a good story, then that's perfectly acceptable. And I was reminded that that actually is what people do with their belief system today. Actually, most people, well, you know, it's our family history. You know, we've always been Catholic. Or it's our family history. We've always been, you know, Orthodox. Or it's our family history. We've always been Muslim. Or we've always been Hindu. Or this is just what we believe. And they actually value their belief without any validation as highly as actual fact. And I'm reminded as a Christian, doctrinally, and as far as our faith and practice, the things that we actually do, that we ought to examine things. We ought to examine things to determine whether or not they're true. And truth ought to hold the highest standard. Truth ought to be what helps us to determine this is what I believe and what I do. I believe that's a tool of the Satan to undermine to undermine people coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, to accept things that aren't true just because, well, you know, it's, it's kind of like our tradition, our heritage, and it's what we've always believed. And even though it probably actually didn't happen that way or it wasn't actually so, uh, it's a valued part of our identity. And so we hold to it. Santa Claus. People do. I mean, literally people hold. I mean, this is like their eternal destiny is held to this kind of a notion. It really helped me a lot understanding Greek culture, and I don't know if it'll help you a lot, uh, but it was something that was insightful for me as I was traveling, just thinking, man, they just love their mythology. They just love it, love it, love it. Always talking about mythology. Everything is about mythology. And uh, I won't have time to show you all the pictures of it. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just start blasting through pictures here in a little bit and throw some commentary out there. Melissa, if you want to interrupt and give some commentary as well, that would be all right because she could, she's more accurate than I am with things uh, as far as she remembers things a little better than I do. I'm more of an overview kind of a person, and she's more of a, you know, well, this is exactly what happened, how it was. So. <laughs> I just, I'm more of the mythological picture guy, and the myth behind the picture is what we go with. Well, so we were in the agency, and we did the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, and I don't really know the reason why we did it this way, but I think because there was another tour group with which our smaller group coincided that uh, had planned it this way, we went backward. So if you take Paul's second missionary journey, the whole time, you know, if you could just read the Bible backward, it would have been simpler for me. So if I could have started at uh, Amphipolis or Philippi and read my way back to, uh, to Mount Ephesus, that's what we did. Uh, here's a map here that gives you a little idea of what uh, some of the places that we went. And in Paul's second missionary journey, we didn't get to do some of the things. Uh, and my wife was probably happy that we didn't. We didn't get to go to Antioch and Iconium uh, and Tarsus. These areas right here, of course, we didn't, go to, we didn't get to go to Israel. Uh, so we didn't do this part right here. We did this part around the Aegean Sea of Paul's missionary journey. Plus, we went to Patmos, which is around here somewhere. And we uh, went to... Uh, Crete, we went to Santorini as well, but Santorini doesn't, it's a beautiful, beautiful place, but it doesn't have any biblical significance, although probably the apostles were there. They probably went there. One of the things I was also impressed by as we went there was just how many islands are in the sea. You know, the sea is incredibly deep, incredibly beautiful, and they're just, you know, you, you're on the cruise ship, you come outside, you're just passing another island all the time, just islands absolutely everywhere. Something else that impressed me, on the day that we went to Santorini, 
or we were supposed to land at Santorini in our large cruise ship, which was seven story, no, nine floors, I guess, all together. Uh, we, it was too rough for us to make a landing there. And it, I was just thinking about the Apostle Paul and all the times that he traveled through the Mediterranean Sea and traveled these very waters, and here we are in a, you know, a ship that's nine floors high, and it's too rough for us to get out of the ship uh, safely. And yet, it was just, and so shipwrecks and that sort of thing would have been just so commonplace in the day. And I would tell you something, by the time you travel, the trip that we did in just eight days, you just thought, man, Paul was a bad dude. I mean, this, this guy was tough. And, other, and, and some other thoughts, some other things. So uh, I don't have everything in my, in my PowerPoint because it just takes so long to, to load. We, this is uh, kind of a, an evening picture of where we stayed in a hotel on the seashore. And uh, this is Kusadasi, it's a Turkish city. Uh, the Turks have a lot of what used to be the Greek Empire is part of their, uh, I guess, part of their country. And the Ottoman Empire conquered and, and Islamified or Islamicized a great deal of the Turkish Empire. Incidentally, the equivalent, the, the Greek Orthodox equivalent to the Pope is in Islam, or is not Islam, but, um, Istanbul. And it's, that's comical to me because there's, there, it, well, one of the things, another takeaway that we had was just how much tension there is between Greece and Turkey. It's really, really very tense. And we had a very patriotic Greek guy, uh, a lady, and it was very fun to say Turkish about anything. Is that Turkish or Turkey? Just, just to use the word Turkish. I'll give you another funny story. When we were in Piphilus, uh, we were eating lunch at a restaurant, and there was a, at a Greek restaurant, and uh, <laughs> we had one of, the, one of the people in our group accidentally tried to pay with Turkish lira instead of euros. And the uh, owner of the restaurant says, "Oh, this is not this is not uh, proper currency. I don't know, maybe Turkish." And he didn't even want to say, you know, like this is the wrong kind of money. But he was not going to accept Turkish money. They'd accept U.S. dollars everywhere. The Turks would accept uh, euros or dollars, but the Greeks didn't even want to acknowledge that there was any such thing as Turkey at all. And so that was that was an interesting. Uh, something interesting that as we are coming along, and then when you see how small Turkey is, about the size of Alabama, I'm not sorry, not Turkey, Greece. Greece. Greece is about the size of Alabama, and you see how the borders just, you know, are completely Turkey and Greece, and then, you know, disputed areas all through the Aegean Sea. You realize just how volatile and how dangerous, especially all those things that are going on with Erdogan and so forth, with overthrowing the elections, and uh, and now Erdogan is is wanting to convert some of the remaining Orthodox church buildings in Turkey to a uh, mosque and so forth. So it's a very, very tense place as far as the, uh, not just the politics of it go, but as far as the Turkish and the Greeks. And then if you understand that the Greeks' economy is absolutely horrific, uh, you realize the importance, uh, the importance that they hold to everything that happens in the United States of America. Everything, I would say they can talk all kinds of trash, but they have no means of protecting or defending themselves. If the United States stands with them, they're good. If the United States doesn't stand with them, they're just, they're in a lot of trouble. The Turks are in much, much stronger position economically because they don't have socialism in their country. Uh, and so they're, they're in much, much better position. The country's doing much better. Turkey, same beautiful country along the Mediterranean, but the differences, and probably if you uh, spray graffiti all over the Turkish uh, cities, they'd probably kill you or something. So it's not trashed as badly as the angry Greeks' cities. So moving forward, uh, this is Kusadasi. This is a view from our hotel room, actually. No, this is, yeah, this is from our, where you ate on top of our restaurant. Pretty place, very nice. And we had a, a good time there. I don't, this is just another view of outside of where we're at, right there on the, right there on the Aegean <coughs> Sea. Ephesus is six miles from Kusadasi. Yes, what about Kusadasi? Well, one of the neat things about Ephesus, and of course this entire region of the world, one of the sayings that they say over there, especially in Greece, is that ancient sites are to the Greeks like sand is to camels. They really don't value them very much, which is very surprising to me. These sites are two, three thousand years old, and you know you could take a shovel, and you know the the uh, kids could just 
dig things up if they wanted to. And they, they, uh, the Greeks don't do any archaeological, uh, they don't have archaeologists themselves. Uh, if you go to Ephesus, the Armenians uh, excavated Ephesus. If you go to Corinth, the Americans uh, excavated Corinth, and so on and so forth. They don't, their, their cities are only begun to be excavated. It's, it's amazing. It's all there. It's in Corinth and Ephesus, the cities are all there, and they could be excavated and, and really reconstructed. And they are just gorgeous. They're unbelievably beautiful. And yet the Greeks make money by taking people to tour the sites that other people have excavated. And I'm a little surprised at how much, and this isn't probably a nice thing to say, but I was a little surprised at how much lacking of enterprise. Another pastor and I were saying, man, if this were American, we'd have helicopter tours. We'd be pushing a million people through here a day. And Corinth was incredible. Like, we, I'd have millions of people here if this were the United States. Like, if we had a site like this to show off, we'd be making some money from it. I promise you that. And we'd have it all excavated. And, no, and we'd have... You wouldn't be touching anybody. I mean, you can walk up to pillars and touch them. You can touch the bema, you know, or climb around on it. You know, there's just it was incredible, uh, the access that you had, which made it really special, but kind of made you wonder, you know, wonder why they have economic problems here. It's because I think they're not so enterprising. They, they are very similar to what they said in Paul's day about the people in Athens, that they like nothing better than to hear a new thing or to, uh, you know, you know, learn a new thing and so they're they're hearing and learning they're like a whole nation full of Millennials still going to college and living in mama's basement not a very nice thing to say that's my impression uh, this is uh, this is a picture of some ruins outside of Ephesus which indicate these would be gates up a hill there's a valley uh, if you can just imagine a large valley uh, you probably can't imagine it very well but there's a large valley and there would be uh, there would be literally those rocks up there would be just ruins all the way to the top of the valley. The city of Ephesus would have held about 250,000 people. Think on that just for a minute. The city of Fort Lauderdale is just under 200,000 people. And this would be a valley that would uh, be a mile, you know, within a mile of that many people living together. So you talk about a very urban, very developed city. Incredibly developed city. And the neat thing about the city of Ephesus is that it is it's about six miles inland from Kusadasi. And so what happened is just much like in our, our Mississippi Delta in the Louisiana area where the river, the Mississippi River, washes water or washes sediment and silt out and builds up the land. Well, Ephesus was once on the sea and then the sediment uh, washed it out. And the beauty of that is that the city was not rebuilt after, a, after an earthquake. The people just moved with the water. They moved closer to the water. And so it's all there. The original Ephesus, a couple thousand years old, is all there. And let me just show you some neat things about it. This is just when you're first coming up and you start to see, and you start to go up in the top part of the city. And this is the beginning kind of the, of the Agora. The Agora would be the marketplace or the pathway that goes down through the center of the city. And here's a little note about the Roman bathing facilities. And they were actually very fascinating. Here's a little model of what I was telling you about. Of course, there would have been some walls, but you can see kind of up the side of the valley on this side and down on this side. And it's just sort of a reconstruction. This would be the gymnasium. Um, and Mrs. Price is getting text. Uh, but anyway, there's, these are some, some people in Greece. Yes, go ahead. Oh, we should turn the light off. I'm very sorry. Those yeah. arches were Romanesque. They were probably built around the time of Christ. Yes, yes. But the Greeks also did. did uh, the, the, the Romans would use smaller stones. The Greeks would have done more monolithic type columns. So I said, so Ephesus was a pretty much Roman city. Would have been a very, very, this, this city would have been rebuilt by the Romans. Would have been a very, very advanced Roman city. Let me show you a few things uh, that you just notice laying around. Over here. Uh, this is this is just, and you can just walk up to it. This is some things that have been pulled up from the ground, indicative of what's underneath them, showing structure and so forth that it's all fallen back, and they can put it back together. This is all marble, and if you get close, you see just how technical and how intricate uh, the ability to sculpt and or to shape rock and or marble was in development. But you see these little pipes; these are everywhere. These clay pipes. And what those are, the, of course, the aqueducts, and there was, there was running water coming from a spring up on the top of the, of the valley all the way through everywhere in Ephesus. And so there would have been fountains running down the, uh, down the main road as it goes down 
uh, to the library and turns over to the, to, to the larger stadium. And running water, bathhouses with, uh, with uh, uh, warm or lukewarm water uh, that you kind of rinse in, and then the real hot bath that you would get in, and then that would run off into the, uh, the powder rooms of the day. I'll show you some pictures of those because they were nicer than what they have there now, so they impressed me. Uh, everything there. This is just a picture on a piece of block. And everything has all this writing, all this Greek writing. And I hope I get time someday because I just snapped a bunch of random pictures. hope I get time someday just to translate it and just read the inscriptions. That's one of the things that I thought, why in the world doesn't somebody just come here and translate everything and put like a plaque next to it? But again, Americans... You know, it's the way we think. Uh, again, these would be, see those clay pipes on the ground there? Those, those are the, you know, a couple thousand year old uh, water system, aqueduct system. And look how great a shape they're actually in. I mean, you really could put them back into service. I was really impressed with that. A matter of fact, uh, as far as building and architecture goes, they're unrivaled. The, the folks that settled Ephesus, if you look at the, the quality of the building, and you can very, very easily envision what it must have been like in Paul's day, and if I were walking through there, of course, again, marble to the Greeks is nothing either. But if you were to walk through that city down the marble roads and look at all the marble buildings and, and these massive stone uh, columns and so forth, you'd just be like, whoa, this is some city. And, and Ephesus was a very, very rich city. Uh, there's, uh, this is a little state. Oh, and there's another picture of some of, those, some of the plumbing. Again, it goes all the way through everywhere. And it's exposed. This is a little stadium. This isn't the one that Paul would have been dragged in, but this is a stadium kind of at the top of the city, and it would have had, uh, this would have been the covered area where these pillars are in the front of it. And uh, so you can kind of envision a little bit what's, what it must have been like. Uh, this uh, is kind of off on the side. I, was, I don't know what I was taking a picture like that for, and I missed a bunch of them. There's some steps here that would have led into, this would have been an overhead, uh, like covered Agora marketplace. Uh, this this marble road on the right, you can see the pillars here on the left and the steps going up into it, and so it would have been a, just a long portico, a really long, long covered area, which would lead down to the marketplace that Paul was would have been dragged down. This again would be uh, standing on that long part. See the columns on either side that are still there. If you get up close, you can see a lot of inscriptions and carvings and uh, all of these beasts and so forth that you can see here everywhere. Just I mean, I just couldn't begin to show you. I could give you a little picture, but I couldn't begin to show you how many statues and carvings, and of course a lot of things have been stolen as well. This is that, that little stadium we were climbing up to have a view. And of course up to the top of the valley, it would have all been developed and settled. This would be from the stadium. This is a little stadium, only seats a few thousand people. And going down the marketplace, this would have been the road where Paul would have been dragged as, uh, as they were protesting Demetrius and the silversmiths protesting the financial hit that had happened. Remember Paul, when he went to the city, first he cast out a devil out of somebody, and then after that, the people began to they began to have a major uh, a major revival. Matter of fact, I like to I like to actually read that text right now. I got to read it from up at the top of where the rich people's condos was, and I was able to yell, "Great is Diana of the Ephesians!" And you could just hear it through the whole valley. And so I thought of what it must have been like with the population. If you figure maybe twenty or 30,000 people were out yelling, it just had to have been just a total, just chaotic, fun. It could have been a real fun riot that day. It was probably, uh, it was probably better than the, uh, what are the people that, that protest uh, success in the United States, the one percenters or whatever. What, what's the group of people that, that, uh, George Soros pays to protest everything. Oh, you know, I can't remember it anyway. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see here. Uh, no, that's Corinth. Wrong chapter. Yeah, let's, let's just read this real quickly. This is Acts 19.13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews exorcists took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name... Uh, of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preached. And there were seven sons, one of Siva, a Jew, and chief pre chief of the priest, which did so. And the evil spirit answered, said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? 
And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And I'm just thinking, being there and seeing it with my eyes, this happened in Ephesus. This is something that uh, that this is something that everybody would have seen. It's just it's a large population, but it's a small area. And so it would be like you're in the Miami Heat Stadium, for instance, where there are 25 or 30,000 people, and there's a guy screaming in there when everybody else is quiet. You know, it would just be something that it would have made the news. Uh, in verse 17, this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. And here I am standing in Ephesus, and I've just read this, and I'm just thinking, man, this is where that happened. Yeah, this is that place. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in his spirit when he passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've seen uh, there, uh, after I've seen been there, I must also uh, see Rome. And I want to read verse uh, 23. At the same time, there rose no small stir about that way. For a certain man, 24, named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of the like occupation. And said, "Sirs, we know that by this craft we have our wealth." Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that temple, the great goddess Diana, should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. When they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath, and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And I yelled that there. And the whole city was filled with confusion, and having uh, caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. And so it's just this big riot, and nobody even knows what's happening. Everybody's just hollering and yelling. And they, the theater seats about 30,000 people. And so he just filled up with a bunch of protesters. And so let me see if I can accelerate it here a little bit. These uh, would be off to the left. These would be some Roman uh, statues. And this would be one of the Roman emperors. I forget which one it was, but uh, some contemporary Roman guy. There is an ancient cat sitting on a column. And... Uh, there are several cats there, and they're unmoved. You can walk by and poke them and prod them, and they blink lazily at you and uh, seem as though they've been there a few thousand years and are wondering why they're being disturbed. It's just interesting being in an ancient place with ancient ruins and see cats sitting on columns. So the city is still populated. Uh, this is, a, uh, of course, a, a fig tree, and what impressed me was the figs were like this, just growing out of a spot where there's a, there is a, you know, just a, space it between a rock and, and uh, the, I brought a couple of figs back and I got permission from the guy in Miami actually bring them through customs he said he didn't care about it. so I'm going to try to plant a couple of fig trees from Ephesus as a memento I don't know if they grow or not but it's an idea I have I'm always trying to get something from somewhere and plant it so I can have memories but I was really impressed with how I mean this thing is is just a nuisance they're just growing out of the side and it's incredibly fertile you have never seen anything so fertile as the Mediterranean, this area. Just everything is gorgeous and just growing like crazy. Uh, this is, oops, uh, there's just some intricate carvings. You probably can't see them too well, but of some grapes and different fruits and so forth. And just a very, very nice, I think that was an olive vat or something like that. Mosaics everywhere on the ground, still there, and they let you walk on them. <laughs> so this would be on if you're going down the marketplace to where the, the there's a library at the bottom of the hill you'll see that structure in a moment and then it turns to the right and you go down toward the theater and there'll be another uh, agora or marketplace these would be uh, the the rich part of town this would be the equivalent of what today would be uh, high-end condominiums or penthouses and I, I have a lot of pictures in here but I just can't show you any pictures I, I mean we've got like a ton of cities to show you and 
this would be looking at it. You could, it's being excavated right now. They're working on it. That would be looking down toward the marketplace. That big building is the library. They're rebuilding that. All the stones are still there. Uh, but let's see if I can find. Oh, there's yeah, the Diana. This is inside this part that I was taking a picture of. See the mosaics and the um, <coughs> just the detail of how fancy the the buildings were. Another houses. mosaic in the houses that the rich people lived in. <coughs> uh, but this would have been where the uh, the governors and the, the heads of the city would have lived. You had to pay, you had to be very wealthy in order to be one of the politicians. And you would have paid your own way. Uh, you would have donated a lot. This is on the library. This would be, a, 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 you can see the inscription to Agrippa. And uh, yeah, it shows the uh, Caesars, Mithridates, and the fathers, and so forth. This is their lauded god, and this is a uh, it's a sad, but it's a funny story. Uh, this would be Diana of the Ephesians, or Artemis is the Greek name. When the Romans took over the empire, they renamed her to Diana, but Artemis. And she's the goddess of fertility. And if you, you were to look closer, you'd see it's a pretty perverse, pretty perverse image. And so we won't look at it too terribly closely. Um, wow, got out of there fast. Uh... There's supposed to be a stadium in here somewhere. Did I not get the stadium in? Let me switch some things up here and see if I can get you a view of... Sorry about that. Uh, un momento. Let me just switch to my photos. Something's missing. Something's not right here. Uh-oh. Is that... I can drag this into the screen. Yeah. Let me just put my photos into the screen here and see if I can get lucky. Okay, I need to go back a ways in some pictures here, and I'm just going to try to cycle through quickly and stop at some significant ones. This will probably work better. This is, sorry about that, we're pretty far ahead of where I want to be. I don't know who that goofy guy is. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, there we go. This is at the end of the day that we were in Ephesus, and there's a fort that's pretty neat in Kusadasi. And so, okay, here's what I want to come to. Um, moving forward here. This is a church. They say this is up on a hill. That's a back. Uh-oh. This is what happens when you hit the button too many times. Okay, this is a baptistry in the St. John's Church, and supposedly St. John lived on this hill. And of course, this is something that I wanted to, that uh, made the trip less special. Every time there's a significant place that any of the apostles were, mm -hmm. um, you know, the pagan religions like Catholicism and Orthodoxy, which are the one and the same, they've got to go and build something on top of it. And, or they make up things and you just don't know if it was ever real or not. You don't know if it's ever true. And I personally, they say that this is the, the area where St. John wrote the Gospel of John. And they call him St. John. Of course, he was John the Apostle. Uh, and that's, that's a baptistry. They say that's St. John's Baptistry. I don't think John probably ever baptized anybody there. And since the building was built probably a thousand years, no, no, not that long. 500 years probably after uh, he was dead, he probably didn't baptize anybody there as far as I can know. But as far as they're concerned, it's, it's valid because it's named and it's called that by the Orthodox Church. One of the things I warn you out of, at, about as a believer is just buying into Catholic history because they, they are very, very uh, loose with the facts. Facts have nothing to do with it. If there's money to be made, if you can get somebody to come and pay to see it. And they like to build shrines, and so they put shrines on top of absolutely everything. But when we walked into this place, Here's what I wanted to tell you about. Uh, one of the pictures that I took was of some green marble columns and overhead. And they say they're very proud of those columns because they came from the temple to Artemis. There's a huge temple to Artemis. And all that's left for them, the temple to Artemis, if I can find a picture of it here, I'll show you, is um, this, these are the fields down below here. And they're gorgeous. Very, very well maintained. It's fixed. And... Uh, dates and olives and tomatoes and just you name it, everything grows there. It's like the, the valley out in California 
this is this is a fort on, that was a, a Muslim fort, and St. John wrote everything there. <laughs> Those are the myths. These things didn't mean so much to me, and I didn't take good pictures because they just didn't have any spiritual significance. But I did think the countryside was pretty, and so I took some pictures of that. Here it is. This is all that's left of Artemis or Diana's temple. This is where it was at, right here, and where the water is at. And it would have been an incredibly elaborate structure. But it's not there anymore because the marble from it is in every Orthodox church all over the country, even across the sea. I mean, they they literally took all the marble from it and, oh, you know, we're going to make build our, our holy place. And so it's just a little bit of a reminder. I asked uh, the Orthodox lady, I said, how much of orthodoxy, because uh, she made a lot out of orthodoxy and she made a lot out of mythology. I said, how, how significant is mythology in orthodoxy? She said, well, of course, you know, what's the God of light for the Greeks? You know, that would be Jesus. And we know that, that Artemis or Diana is Mary. And, and all the pagans that were, were forced by Constantine to become Roman uh, Christians of course, they just kept right on worshiping. Okay, well, let's just move our temple over here. We'll take our marble and our, our effigies and all these things, and let's just move them there. And really, organized religion is just uh, it's just paganism. It's, it's just more paganism. So uh, this would be, there wasn't much there to see. This, I think, is in our cruise ship. It's an accidental picture of something. Uh, this is a cool engine because it reminded me of Cubans. Uh, it has a, 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 a put together a two stroke diesel with a couple PVC pipes to, uh, to handle it from the back part. And probably they go everywhere in that thing. I'm always impressed with, uh, with backward engineering. So this is a statue in Cusadas. See, I try to get out of here. We're getting ready, toward the end of our day here, we're getting ready to leave the next morning to go on the, or on the cruise on the, one of the ships. You know, Melissa and I are just out walking around seeing if we can see anything interesting. Melissa needed some coffee, and so there are the cups from her coffee. The coffee's, you know, it's free at the hotel, so drink a lot. So, anyway, there's our waiter. I got a picture of him busting our table because I was impressed that he could stack it all up. Um, the cruise ship, picture of our hotel, picture of some of the people. Uh, Cusadasi, very pretty town. See the pastel colors on the houses up on the hill there? And they paint them all the way down, so uh, very, very pretty. I didn't intend to show you all these pictures. I'm just trying to fire through them real quick. I'm sorry for making you dizzy. Uh, out in the in the sea, everything is. There are all these little islands. I wonder if there's a way to make this a full screen here. No. Well, bottom right. Um, oh. Yeah, there it is. Bottom right, the double arrow there. Right, how close am I? Very bottom corner. Down. Right there. Yeah. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you full screen it, bud. <laughs> yeah, it's small screens for resolution sake. I'm not sure why it does that. There, there's, here we go. There's a, there's, a, there's a man on a cruise boat. Looks sad, doesn't he? That one doesn't. <laughs> oh, hum, that's cute. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I, I took pictures of those for Lee. Those are those little things that you do walking tours with that the guide can talk and put them on. They can be good for people who can't hear well in church services to have a headset. <laughs> anyway, the whispers is what they're called. This is Patmos. This is the island of Patmos. And this is where the Apostle John was. And this is a pretty good perspective. So see how you kind of come into uh, the waterway and right in here would be where you would land off of the, the ship when they ferry you in. That would be where John probably came in. There are quarries all over the island. Unfortunately, when we were at Patmos, we spent most of the day looking at shrines. There was a monastery at the top of the hill with a lot of gold in it. We had to look at that. And then there was a cave that they said was St. John's Cave. And there's a place in there where he laid his head and somebody rubbed his back or something. And not really, but um, <laughs> they make up things, so I might as well as well. But it was very neat to be on Patmos. And just thinking, okay, we talk about John being exiled on Patmos, and I wouldn't mind being exiled there for a little bit of time. Uh, if anyone has a notion of exile, a beautiful, beautiful little city. And uh, just very, very, very pretty. And 
neat, neat little place, and we had a lot of fun. Um, these pillars have some, I took pictures of these pillars because they've got some green marble in them, which came from uh, Artemis's temple. <laughs> Almost everywhere we went. I didn't take very many pictures in the monastery, and I'm sorry for that if you wanted them, but that's Patmos there. Isn't that pretty? A beautiful place. And I recommend, if you ever got to go to the Mediterranean, I would recommend spending a week at Patmos. You can rent a scooter for about $20 a day and cruise around. And uh, if you could ever do it, it would be a really beautiful place to go and look and just uh, be able to get to a quiet place and read Revelation and just think about what it must have been like when John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day and God spoke to him there in that place. That's what's significant about Patmos, uh, not any of the shrines that are there. And so I also, anyway, I don't want to say... This is, these are little cafes, and pretty cheap, actually. You get coffee or, or gelato or whatever, and uh, pretty, pretty neat places. A lot of people. This is just an over, uh, overlook area where we were taking photos. I've got to really zip along. I've, we've, we're on our second day here. <laughs> we have eight. Um, that's, a, that's a street in Patmos, narrow streets, and people riding scooters and little cars up and down, as you can see. And then, of course, they got tables and sidewalks. But uh, just a pretty neat place. And what I liked about Patmos was that you could tell where the locals hung out. There would be a speed place with all the men sitting there drinking coffee. And I thought, yeah, this is where I'd go if I were here and preaching the gospel. This is where I'd sit down and meet people so I could have the opportunity to share Christ with them. This is Pat leaving Patmos in the evening. Yes, sir? Patmos still part of Greece or is it part of Turkey? It is Greece. Yeah, okay. it is Greece. I know Rhodes is too and it's right on the coast. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, as soon as you get out of uh, Cusidasi, then everything is pretty much Greece. But it's disputed a lot of it, and not Patmos, but a lot of it. Uh, Erdogan is drilling for. There's, they're finding out there's a lot of oil uh, in the sea there, and they're wanting to drill. And so it's, it could be a real hot button here in a couple of years, unless the Greeks just let him do whatever he wants to do. So his party lost their election uh, in, for the city mayor of Istanbul, and so he overthrew the election. They're, they, they're going to have a recount. Who knows when that's going to happen, but the majority of people obviously don't want his party, but he's not really concerned about that. So they're, the Greeks don't have much good to say about him. In, in our cruise ship, every time we came back, somebody had been in our room, messed around, and folded our towel into animals. That one's a yeah, turtle. They do that. So, um, yeah. A Cithrio, our ticket. And that's our ticket to, let's see, the Ministry of Culture and Sports Archaeological Resources. But I don't know what that is. Somewhere we went. Uh, this is Crete, the island of Crete. I enjoyed being there. And I, uh, you know, again, you know, with my slanted uh, I, the American worldview, I uh, judged everybody and, you know, the culture as I walked around. <laughs> and so. Uh, I, I reminded myself of Paul writing to Titus, of course, and uh, the thing that he said, he said, you know, one of their own poets, a poet of their own, said, the Cretans are all liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And uh, this witness is true, <laughs> Paul said. So uh, I was just thinking about Paul walking there and his impression that the Cretan people didn't have very good moral character. And then he goes on to say to Titus, I said, left you there to ordain, you know, to basically teach the people how to be and ordain pastors in every city, ordain elders in every city. And uh, I'm reminded that people are just people no matter who they are. You can have a bad culture and you can have good people. And you can have good people in a bad culture. But what makes the difference is Christ in us and the influence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is interesting, as we were there on a Sunday morning, actually, early in the morning, and uh, the Orthodox churches are full there, which is sad because you know that it was that, that the true church was hijacked. I would love to have met some real believers in Crete, but we uh, didn't didn't know anyone there or any place to go, so we ended up holding a service on the cruise ship later on uh, that that day. I don't know if I have pictures of that, but this is one of the most ancient cultures. The most ancient civilization is on the island of Crete, and it's the Melissa's the Minoans. It's the Minoan culture, and how old is it? Is it 4,000 years old? It's just just post flood. I know it's yeah. Yeah, it's just post flood, they and they have flood before the kings. yeah before the kings of Israel. Of Israel. So it's pretty cool to be unearthing 
you know, this city, walking through this city, look at the size of the rocks and the stones and, and uh, just the way that this, built, this is built out. There's, they had a written language, there's inscriptions on everything, but they have not decoded, they have not deciphered the language, which I attribute probably to the laziness of the Greeks, because I think that with computer technology today, you could probably figure out a way, but again, that's my um, arrogant American judgmental attitude. Uh, their, their, their design would be like postmodern, uh, you know, everything is square and, and uh, is, is symmetrical. Uh, look at the colors of the uh, of the, the pillars and everything that's remaining there. This this palace this would have been a palace, and it would have burned down uh, because the the olive oil vats, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, actually these these are existing frescoes that are still there, you know, thousands of years old. It just kind of blows your mind. And these are pots. Uh, those pots are about seven foot tall. It's hard to get a perspective on it. This, you can see here, you can't get much perspective, but these are big vats that were full of olive oil, and you can see they're still dark from when they caught fire and the palace was destroyed. And there's a labyrinth under it. I can't remember all the details, but you people that are into the Indiana Jones type movies and so forth, in the queen's room, there are five doors just right beside each other, and each of them goes like, depending on if you know your way, you can get lost underground there very, very easily. We weren't allowed to go in because it wasn't safe. And so and I was going to sneak back later, but I forgot to. And there's some more uh, something. This is where the king would have sat along with his priest. The king would have been considered to be a royal deity, so they would have had a sacrifice or blood sacrifice in, uh, where he would have sat in his throne room. There's a basin there. Uh, I guess a big basin or a little basin, but that would be a ceremonial cleansing thing. And... Uh, for part of their worship, and there's a there's a tub or a place that they would go for cleansing, and the king's throne would be over on the right side. And I don't understand all that stuff, and I think that probably the archaeologists make up half of it anyway. So, uh, pretty nice chairs, though. I thought that looked pretty comfortable, much better than their toilets in Greece. There is a uh, it's just a, a, a wine press uh, there, it's just sitting there. It's thousands of years old, and you can walk on it. I, People are climbing around this stuff, and I just can't believe something could be three or four thousand years old. You'd think they'd block it off where you couldn't touch it. They wouldn't let you walk on their sidewalks or whatever, but no, not the case. That was That's pretty neat. I thought that was pretty cool. Again, some of the buildings that they've unearthed and, and so forth. Again, thousands of years old. Pretty neat. I don't know what that was, but it had some cool carvings in it, so I took a picture of it. This is the city. Uh, there's snow caps on Crete. They could if, if the, they said they don't know why, but the, but the Cretans and the Greeks don't, don't snow ski. But uh, they did recently get somebody probably from the United States. That's a fresco in the king's room. See, I was telling you about those five doors that lead into labyrinth, labyrinth and so forth. And uh, it's a pretty, pretty neat place. Not very interesting to me, honestly, other than the historical value of it. Uh, I, was, I was more on a missionary journey of the Apostle Paul than I was... Uh, you know, archaeological discoveries, and so much overload. Any place we went, I could have spent weeks. And so at a certain point, it's just like snap a photo and think about it later because it's just too much. Uh, but pretty neat place. This would have been their theater, the Manoan Theater. And uh, there's the clay pots. Those are, those, the back one's about probably eight foot tall. And it's got handles. I don't know if they climbed up the side or tilted it over or whatever. Can you imagine just having clay pots like that sitting outside under a you know, just a lean to. Those are actually the actual ones. They're not reproductions. And they unearth those. I just can't imagine just putting them outside. But they've made it several thousand years, so I guess they'll be all right. Uh, they did put a cage on those, though. You can't climb in them. Yes, yes ma'am. Were those seven-foot high ones? Or those yes, those there were. Those would have been. This is a picture from somewhere else. I think when I came down the hill, I took a picture of this kind of theater up on the left. This is Crete, and this is most of what we did in Crete because, again, anything that Paul would have done would have been on the other side of the island from where we were, and anything Paul would have done would have been covered up with a shrine. That's the theater there. See how they would have just, it kind of settled, but they would have sat on different levels. There's Melissa. That waterway, they still have the water system. Yes, yeah, they, they had, they had, uh, that's the oldest civil plumbing. Yeah, it's the oldest civilization, and they had running water. I mean, they had running water in their city, you know. 
I just can't stop Mrs. Price from being a distraction. Uh, this is this is the harbor, and it was a pretty day, so we took some pictures. I always like boats. I like going to any harbor anywhere, and I, I'm at one with the fishermen. So, just some pictures before we got back on our cruise ship. That's the Titus' uh, church right there. Not really, but it's named for him. This is... I wish I'd taken pictures. There were there were kids playing um, accordions, singing through their nose, trying to get money, and it was cute. But we're out of there. So this is evidently us leaving, and it, it was a blustery day. Uh, the pictures can't tell you how windy it was, but it was a windy sea that day. And I thought, boy, if I were Paul, this would be one of those days when he said, I told you not to, to go there. This is in our in our service, and. There's some funny stories I don't have to tell about it. It was we had we had we I had Lord's Supper service and had a good fellowship with other believers on the ship. Incidentally, uh, I've never been on a cruise before, but almost everyone on the cruise was a Christian. And so I saw one pastor drinking, but other than that, there was like no drinking or uh, it was just really a pleasant experience. Just people that were they were just wonderful. Yeah, it was just a happy, upbeat bunch of people walked out on the deck. And a bunch of, uh, of the Asian people were singing in their language, singing hymns, and it was just a, it was pretty neat, pretty fun experience. See how windy it is? I'm just sitting, I'm on the upper deck, and it's probably blowing 50 or 60 mile an hour. It's, it is ripping. That's the day we're, we're on the way to Santorini. And so <laughs> I couldn't open my eyes. It was, there I'm trying to walk forward, and it was like being in a hurricane, uh, except you know, the news report, you know, the news report bends over and then the people just walk by. So, <laughs> I thought about doing some, some memes of that. But uh, this is this is when we're approaching Santorini and you can just see there's just a mist on the water because the wind's whipping so hard it's blowing water off of the surface of the water. Uh, I'm gonna see if I, I took a lot of pictures so I wouldn't miss anything, but let me just blast through them. Um, these are, this is coming into Santorini. And you want to know much about Santorini, Brother Tim's been there and spent a lot more time there than I have, so he could tell you it's a beautiful place. Probably the prettiest place in Greece, I suppose. These are volcanic cliffs, and the islands are volcanic, and there's me getting a picture in the wind. <laughs> I was trying to take a picture, and I actually took a selfie. Uh, but <laughs> look at my hair. <laughs> and that's without any hair, so... Uh, it was really windy. That's why we couldn't land that day. And I just, again, my thoughts as we were going by here was Paul sailed through these waters. And he wasn't on a big cruise ship like this. Nope. So, yeah, I'm just telling look, look at these ladies. Look at them leaning forward there against the wind. Fake news. Uh, <laughs> I, you see my finger when I'm trying to take pictures? I was afraid I was losing my, my, I had my camera, I was afraid I'd lose it. I was just yeah. wrapping my hand around it, and then I kept getting my finger in the picture. What time is it, Melissa? Oh, man, I'm sorry, people. we got to get out of here. <laughs> Let's leave Santorini. Very pretty. We're still coming in, approaching it. You can go by and look at it, but we can't stay. Houses built all the way down the cliffs. You can see it's just stunning. Uh, for whatever reason, the color's not so, I guess the color's way better over here, isn't it? On this one over here, I guess I didn't notice that, but uh, this screen does depict much better colors over here. You see the roads going up. You can take donkeys up the paths, I guess. We didn't, and we're leaving. Too stormy. See the snow-capped mountains, though? Any clue what the elevation is out there for those snow caps to still be? High enough for there to be snow. This is pretty neat. Okay, now we're at a significant place, and this is this is probably where we'll end up tonight, just past here. This is right before you go to Corinth, between Corinth and Athens, which I think is about 30 miles uh, distance between that separates the two. There is a little peninsula that was so hazardous that they actually tunneled through, and this, I think the tunnel is about, maybe it's only like 1800s, but it used to be, in Paul's day, they would have had a setup where they could portage, they could put their ships on land and pull them by donkeys over this narrow stretch of land between these two and avoid going around the treacherous coast because people almost always shipwrecked going around the peninsula. And so it's, we stopped there to use the restrooms and I didn't go to the bathroom because there were too many ladies in the men's restroom to suit me and so I went out and took pictures instead. So Corinth, uh, this is Corinth and underneath these fields 
is the city. It's all there. Uh, it's even underneath some farmhouses that are there. Up on the mountain, there's a fort you can barely see. And if, you know, if Americans were running it, we'd be doing helicopter rides up to see the fortification. But you can't go there. They don't let you go up to the top of the fort. It's not, they don't do anything with it. It's just there. But you can see the walls where the people would have retreated uh, for protection. All the cities would have had fortresses to retreat to for protection. I cannot tell you how beautiful this countryside is. The pictures can't do it justice. The fragrant smell of the yellow flowers of chamomile. And when you get out of the bus, it's just like so fragrant, so beautiful. And then the poppies are growing everywhere. And down this hill on the left is the old stadium of, Ephes of Corinth, which is a very neat thing. You see the pictures there on the left, and we're walking do they, down the hill. Do they have an opium trade there with the poppies? I don't know. Uh, there's poppies. Yeah. And they are litter. They're just stunning in person. They're just beautiful. They're so pretty, you can't take a good picture. Go ahead, Melissa. Um, Corinth is only 5% excavated at this point. 5%. And it still has a bunch that's excavated. It's incredible. What is there is absolutely incredible. Uh, so many Bible pictures, so many things. And I'll try to share a couple with you. But we're going down the hill here. We have a Christian tour guide on this day. She was an archaeologist, and she was brilliant. Uh, when she was in college, she did a display for, at, for the museum in Athens, the historical museum. And the, the, the uh, display got kept there. And then incidentally, she's working there now. And she, how old could she be, Melissa? She looks like a child, but it's probably late mid-20s maybe, mid-20s or so, late 20s, late 20s maybe. Uh, but what was neat about her was that she had a brilliant mind. I've never met someone more enthusiastic about history. And then she's an archeologist on top of that. But, but on top of that, she was a Christian and she understood the significance of the sites from a Christian perspective <coughs> and was just unbelievable at communicating. She was a great speaker as well. She just off the cuff could tell stories for days, just and she knew she knew all the she researched all the myths, knew the actual things about them. Uh, you could ask her about Battle of Troy or whatever, and she'd tell you what's mythological and what's actual. And it, the significance of truth wasn't lost on her. And so, if if ever we were to do a trip, we'd go there. But this is something that's really cool. Uh, if I can find it here again, this is chamomile. I, pictures can't do it justice. I was running around taking pictures. Uh, while I was supposed to be doing other things. This is not excavated, it's all here. This is just extra, this is not part of the part you do the paid tour of, of Corinth in. But this is the city of Corinth, of course, where Paul would have written the two letters to the church at Corinth. A couple of other letters were recorded as well. Uh, and of course, you know, I'd read through, through Corinthians before going there, and I'm just thinking about all the things. You know, Corinth, of course, was the place where Paul had rest. You remember after the Jews had run him out, he'd been persecuted in Athens and Thessalonica, or Thessalonica, and when he went to Corinth, Paul, things just went wonderful for Paul there, and he was there a year and a half, on the, you remember that when he was on the house attached to Crispus, uh, or Crispus house attached to the synagogue, and of course that's where the Jews and the Greeks both got saved, and anyway, as you come down this hill, there's an inscription here, you can't read it, and it's it's really tragic actually, they don't spray some Roundup on it or something, kill some of the chamomile, but uh, in, in, the, in the Greek, the word Erastus, if you read the last couple of uh, verses in the letter of Paul to the Romans, you see him uh, uh, talking about Erastus, the, uh, not the treasurer, but what was the, the, um, what was the term that, that Erastus was. And a lot of people uh, through, throughout the years that attack Christianity have said, well, you know, first of all, Erastus isn't a name because it comes from the word for erotic. Chamberlain? And Yeah, the cha it's a Chamberlain, which would be the treasurer of the city. Uh, and they said, you know, there's no, there was no Erastus. First of all, it's not a name. It's a description of somebody. So nobody would be named Erastus. And this would be down by the stadium where, you know, like they do today, if somebody makes a big donation, they put their plaque, they put their name on something. Well, Erastus the treasurer is the inscription here and he would have been contemporary with Paul, and they discovered that, I think, about 1923. So all the people said, well, there's no Erastus, Paul's name dropping, trying to pretend. You know, there's nobody of any influence, or nobody important is a Christian. Well, Corinth, the treasurer, was a Christian. And so it just kind of gives you a little idea, but that's Erastus' inscription. And because it's not a common name, it's absolutely impossible that it was anybody except for Erastus. And that was one of the first places we saw when we came to Corinth was 
that. Now, let me stop here and tell you what my wife wants me to, to say or what I forgot to say about Ephesus. One of the things I appreciate about Ephesus and in Corinth both was that there were no Christian fingerprints there. You say, well, Pastor, that's not good. No, it is good, actually, because anywhere the Gospel actually goes, the Gospel does not build edifices and temples and shrines. The Gospel reaches people and influences everything else. Christians don't, Christians don't uh, leave a architectural legacy for their faith. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to communicate here, but when a religion conquers a country, the first thing they do is build a high place. Christians tear down high places because we worship God. And one of the beauties of Ephesus is that there is this massive riot. Thousands of people were Christians at Ephesus. When Paul was going to Jerusalem, he sent for the elders of Ephesus to meet him. Remember on the island? And, and he sent for them to meet him and he exhorted them. But there probably were 20 elders there from Ephesus. And if you see how small the place is, one pastor could pastor everybody there. You know, the, the, the Christians had really overtaken Ephesus. And there's not a single cross or any kind of Christian symbol. No fish. None of those things in Ephesus. Why is that? Because Christ lives in us, not in a building made with hands. And uh, that's one of the things. I, I don't know why they haven't made shrines. I guess it's too big, you know, but why they haven't conquered Ephesus religiously, uh, Catholicism or Orthodoxy, but it hasn't. And it's a very refreshing place to go. Incidentally, uh, so is Corinth. Let me show you some cool things in Corinth. If you don't like it, you can slip out. Uh, I'll try to, try to go swiftly here. Uh, that's that again, again, that's the inscription to Erastus. It's frustrating that it's not very easily legible. This is a Greek temple. Uh, and you know it's Greek because of the tapered columns, which are monolithic. Uh, they're not put together in pieces. The Romans would cut pieces of columns and stack them together and pin them. The Greeks made the entire column. And, uh, of course, it's pretty impressive. I'm sure you've seen that picture in your history book somewhere when you were doodling instead of reading the words. Oh, here's another uh, archaeological discovery uh, from uh, the prior century. I thought I'd take a picture of that as well. Some of you probably really don't know what that is. That's an old Greek building. I forget what it is. It's pretty nice. A bunch of Greek buildings. Nice town. Uh, some people standing. <laughs> picture of people standing on top of the ruins there. And that was just standing there. Everything else is unearthed at the time, but they... That's before they started really digging anything up, and that's just ancient Corinth. You know, if you can imagine just going to an uninhabited, unpopulated area, there's these massive pillars, really something, ancient, ancient place uh, built by the Hellenistic Greeks. And the layout of the city is all there. You can go through and you can see the lay of the city. We're going to go into a museum here for a second. Uh, I wish I could show you. I wish I could see that clearly enough to tell you what it is. Uh, some portices and some carvings. Uh, some some guy that mattered. What is that? Well, I guess I can look. No, I can't look at it. Yeah, there, we went through the school of medicine. This one. Oh, look at all the inscriptions. Everything is had inscriptions on it, and none of it was translated. So I think I just took some pictures of things in case I. Uh, could translate. Look at the carvings in the marble. A few thousand years old. Can you imagine trying to carve marble and not chip it? Hmm. Hey, just think about that. Have you, anybody here ever tried to take a chisel and just carve rock? I, to me, if, you, if you've ever built or made anything with your hands, you look at the craftsmanship and you're just like, these people were amazingly advanced. Look at, look at the, look at the uh, carvings. Of, I'm sure I could figure out who it is, but what? So they have all of these all around that section showing for, for the emperors and the new rulers and everything. Yeah, with no style. heads. And some of them, yeah, there are no heads on them. Well, it, some of them change so frequently that they stop making bodies just to have one. They just change the head. Body and put a different head on it for the new ruler. <laughs> new, new ruler, new head. So that's why you they just—they build a perfect body. I noticed the physiques were just like mine. They just carved out physiques like mine, and then they would change the heads on them. 
<laughs> Present your body as a living sacrifice, only acceptable unto God, which is your uh, reasonable service. Uh, when Paul talked about members of the body, members of the church, in Greek culture, in the religion that they had of the day, they had some pretty good doctors and so forth. Uh, if you were to look carefully, you'd see that uh, these look like they're broken, but actually these are sculpted deformities uh, on most of these body parts. And of course, there would be uh, a lot of different types of bodies, some grotesque lumps and different things. If you went to the doctor, before you went to the doctor, if you wanted to be healed, you'd go to a sculptor and you would get a body part made, a representation of your body part that you are praying for healing on. And then you would offer that as, uh, it was part religious and part medicine, but you would offer that part of your body uh, for healing. And so when Paul is preaching to the Corinthians about the parts of the body, uh, these are images that are very, very, the members of the body are images that are very, very real in their minds. And I thought that was pretty cool, pretty neat thing. And so when he's using those illustrations, so I took some pictures the next time I preached the Corinthians, you're going to have to see some more pictures of some of the things that I took uh, that, you know, just, just kind of make things jump out at you and give you a little bit of the nuance or the uh, context that the apostle is speaking in. So, yeah, some more body. I took a bunch of body part pictures. Brain, brain problems. There were some funky looking brains in there. And uh, really is a pretty... Pretty neat thing. Sorry about the lighting being so poor on those. Uh, this would be one of the tombs. Somebody's there. I don't know who's buried there. That's a person. Oh, look at the pottery. Oops. A few thousand years old. Not bad, huh? Isn't that beautiful? That was our tour guide. Uh, I forget what that signified. Let's get out of here. Move forward. A lot of, there's just so much stuff you just couldn't begin to look at it, but just a little museum here at Corinth. Uh, I, I got to preach at Corinth. I posted a picture on Facebook. I don't think it's included in these pictures, but somebody sent me a picture. It looked like everybody was sleeping. It's out in the courtyard. Again, some statues. Uh, Let's see here. I might have missed something significant. No, not the naked guy. Uh, one of the statues was wearing shoes and one was wearing sandals, and I thought that was cool. <laughs> I think they all wore I mean, they had shoes with soles on them. Uh, one of the guys did lace-up shoes, you know, like just ankle high. Some mosaics. A lot of their treasures that were excavated here at Corinth are in Miami, Florida. There's a picture of an article of some guys that got busted by the FBI and they made them send them back. But Americans excavated them, Americans sold them. <laughs> so, I think you should excavate your own treasures. Uh, most, a lot of the Greek treasures are in the British museums from World War II. They sent a lot of their gold and so forth and the British still have them. Well, they're a little sore about that, the Greeks are. Shouldn't have let Hitler march through your country. Oh, here we go. Shoes. See that? Mm -hmm. uh, are those Romans? No. Yes. Oh, they were. I believe so. The, the thing is, is that as far as the Greeks are concerned, the separation between Greek and Roman culture, there really isn't any. Because the Greeks were allowed to have, in other words, the Romans admired Greek culture so much, and the Greeks are very proud of that, that the Romans left it virtually unchanged, including the centers of learning, the philosophers and so forth. So, the, again, the statues without heads. I wish they kept at least one head. I wanted to go get a picture behind it, but everybody was too busy talking. I couldn't even take my picture. I'll put my head in one. There's more inscriptions. This is from a synagogue. There's a cross. So, uh, you know, it's a, later, it's a later inscription. Corinthian columns. Yep. And you see the carvings on them? Is that got those leaves? Those are, those are uh, Roman, of course, you can see because they're in pieces. But still, to make each one identical, 
And then, of course, each of those would represent about 50 that are missing. So let's get to the BEMA. This is on the way down to the marketplace. Just working our way through town. Uh, some of the buildings. Yeah, again, this is you can see in the countryside, everything's grown over. You could excavate it. It's all there. It's only 5% excavated. So what we're looking at, which is really impressive, is only 5% of what's there. Incidentally, a lot of people try to say that Paul got so badly beaten by the philosophers in Athens, and he was so ineffective that he ran to Corinth. You know, he just ran away because it was so difficult for him. But the actually the case is that Athens had a very, very small population, and Corinth would have been the metropolitan center of the day. And of course, was very, Paul was very effective in preaching the gospel in Corinth. And so that was kind of neat, too. Uh, Athens was an, insig an insignificant city. Corinth was the significant city of the day. I think were it not for the Mars Hill where uh, where Paul preached the gospel, I don't think that uh, Corinth would or Athens would have shown up much in the scripture. This is interesting. This is the Bema. Go back real quickly. See a step right down the bottom of the of the pillar there? That would be where right below is a stadium. Back off to the left would be where they would have held their Greek games where you could win a uh, laureate of of uh, celery. And uh, yeah, or celery would be you know, what they would have would have made them out of, and so uh, literally it was everything, and, and the only thing people cared about was actually winning, and so they literally dedicated their lives to winning, and they 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 no one wanted to take second place. It was a very very serious thing. That's what Paul is talking about running the race, and uh, you know not that they that's run the race run all but one win at the prize, so run that you may obtain. And of course the scripture just has a lot of significance to you when you're looking at the stadium where the people run, and you see how in the city, how much athletics, every city had a major gymnasium, and, uh, you know, I had stadiums and theaters, and so it was interesting uh, to see that, but this is the Bema, and you remember the story of what happened here when uh, Paul was, they were, the, the Jews were trying to raise up problems for Paul in Corinth, and Sosthenes, remember Sosthenes, uh, they, anyway, they, uh, what's the name of the guy that got beaten that day? Uh, Gallio the deputy came, and he would have stood here, and he Jason. told the Jews, what? Jason? No. Justice? No. Is it Sosthenes? Yeah, Sosthenes was the Jewish guy that got beaten. The Jews raised up a ruckus, and then Gallio the deputy came to figure out what was going on here. Again, you can see from the size of the city, everybody would have heard, everybody would have known about this. And it's a riot going on because of the Jews causing a riot against Paul for preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. They're trying to undermine him as he's preaching the gospel. Gallio comes and says, "I, you know, he's, when it comes to your customs, your laws, I care nothing for that. You know, if you've got laws, deal with that." And then the crowd grabs Sosthenes and they beat him. <laughs> and uh, this is not a very nice laugh at somebody getting beat. But you just think this guy raised up a whole riot, raised up a whole bunch of people trying to get Paul. Paul got beaten everywhere. And Corinth was that place where Paul, uh, the Holy Spirit, told him that you're going to get to be here for a while, and this is going to be a place that you can rest. And he'd been so badly bruised spiritually by his kinsmen that he said, I, I'm done with you. Uh, the gospel, I'm going to take the gospel only to the Gentiles. And that's when Crispus got saved. The city of Corinth was a very, very special place for him. Uh, let's, let's get through here and go to Philippi. Let's go to, go to Athens. Uh, I'm sorry. Let's go back to Athens. More pillars, green pillar, green stone. Guess where the green stone came from? The, the fields are very, very lush, very pretty. I, I couldn't describe them. Here's an old city that uh, you may or may not know about. Here's an ancient tomb. Uh, I took pictures of this tomb uh, because, one, it's pretty cool. And secondly, uh, look at the size of those. See the size of those pieces of stone that they've stacked up? These ones on the right are probably 20 foot long in length. These walls are. And it's a honeycomb tomb. See, it's honeycomb shaped, and this would have been a very important king. Would have been buried here about uh, the time of uh, Jericho, about the about contemporary with, with Jericho, uh, with the children of Israel marching out of Egypt. So pretty contemporary with, you know, the uh, Egypt in its heyday or in its zenith. And pretty impressive. I guess scale doesn't mean anything in the picture, but they're huge. These stones are huge. There's another uh, chamber in there. 
We went up on the on the hillside, and there's this fortress. And I took pictures of this because our tour guide. This is what is this called, Melissa? It's it's not Minoan. It's the Mycenae. Mycenae, the city of Mycenae, and the Mycenaean ruins. M Y C E N A E. And what's cool about it is when you walk up here, you see how they could throw things down. This is up on the top of a mountain, literally. It, this these walls of the city are incredible. To take this fortress without some kind of aircraft would just be impossible and you know as we're walking up to here our tour guide said she said you know this this is the same vintage as Jericho and these would be similar to the walls of Jericho and I said well that's pretty cool so I took a picture <laughs> uh, there's just so much more to see than there's again you could spend days and they let you walk all the climb all around on it I was always amazed at that you know 4,000 years old, and you can climb on it. 3,500 years old, 3,000 years. Well, let's see, 3,000. And it was built with that style where they had slants up as you go higher and higher and higher. You know, went along with their religious beliefs. Yeah. On our way back to Athens, and evidently this is in the Aegean Sea, snapping pictures in the bus. Uh, this is the uh, Acropolis. And we're on our way up to top of the hill stadium. I don't know what the perspective of that is, but that's the stadium that's on the other side of the hill. You don't usually see that when you take pictures of the Acropolis. So that's pictures down into the stadium. That's a better picture of it right there in Athens. Athens is full of ruins like this. Just, you know, you have a modern city and then it's just got all these ancient ruins all around. You just want to tear the city down and rebuild the beautiful old city. <laughs> it's so much more elaborate. You see the see the pattern on the floor? I don't know if you can see that there, but uh, it's, it's pretty gorgeous. I If I took my uh, marble polishing machine over there, I could really <laughs> I could really get that baby glistening. It's the Acropolis. Most of you in school have seen pictures of this. This is on the way up into it. And again, the high places where the, you know, the religious worship and their favorite gods would go. And it's primarily what it signifies. I, sometimes I took pictures of things like the columns because I like to build things and I'm always impressed with craftsmanship. And it's pretty incredible. Craftsmanship is pretty incredible. Again, not built with slaves, built with free men. And uh, working, in, they built the entire thing in 15 years. It's being rebuilt. So those, taking... those were Freemasons. Huh? <laughs> they were really Freemasons. Uh, look at these pillars. Incredible. They're restoring them. There's a group of guys. They're going to completely rebuild the whole thing except for the cedar and the roofs or the cypress and the roofs. Uh, everything that they know 100% for sure where it went, they can restore. That's their rule. 98% is not good enough. So anything that's 100%, so from the same stone quarry, they're querying out the stones pieces and fitting them into the columns if they're broken out and uh, making them like new again. A lot of people there, it's very difficult to get good pictures without, you could, you know, you'd have to be there pretty early in the morning to not be able to get pictures and there's a lot of traffic that slowed us up. Athens is Get terrible traffic and lots of graffiti. One word to describe Athens and Thessaloniki, graffiti. Scaffolding's here because there's always scaffolding, but it does move. And uh, it just depends on what part they're, they're rebuilding. But if you look at the scale of the place, it's uh, mm -hmm. pretty neat. Again, this was a uh, temple, I think, to Artemis originally, and then it yeah. became to a temple to Mary. And Each, then, each scaffold section is... Uh, a meter and a half or five five feet high. So yeah, it gives you a pretty good scale. You can yeah. look at the people there and see a little bit of scale too. And that's it's fairly impressive. You can also go to Tennessee and there's a concrete one that's made the same size. Uh, but it doesn't have the curves inward to make it look square to the eye. If you look at the scaffolding, I have a picture down the side that shows uh, see how close the scaffolding is at the bottom and how far out from the pillars is at the top. They've slanted everything in, and they thought that it was because of bad building, but actually they engineered it for the eye at a distance to look as though it's completely square. 
And so it's it's probably the most impressive architectural structure in the world. It makes it look taller than it is because it, it because it's leaning in. It, their eye tells you that it's the perspective view looking taller. They thought through a lot of things that they're just so technical that you know it's it's pretty. Matter of fact, a lot of things they say I didn't even discover until about 20 years ago. And again, I can't remember all that. What? No, the columns aren't. They're not the same size. They're different sizes. They're curved. It's all because it's all for aesthetics. It's all to look, uh, uh, to look symmetrical. You can see the white the white patches in the columns, and that's the restoration work. It's from the same stone quarry that the original pillars were quarried out of. But of course, they haven't sat in the sun and faded or yellowed over the years. And so, if you can imagine the whole building being that color of white when it was initially that white marble when it was initially built. Marble, of course, being a higher grade of limestone. So they get it all done and they've got a temple to virgins. That's what it amounts to. There's another temple here on the left. Yeah, yeah. Sad. Well, it was a mosque and it got bombed by the Germans in World War II. That's what blew it apart. That's the stadium again. See how it's built all the way up the wall even though it's overgrown there? That's the size of the stadium. You can see that the really large part down below. But look carefully and you will see that uh, the seats of the stadium came all the way up to the top of the hill. It's a big structure. Isn't that incredible? Can you imagine? And uh, when I was in the stadium, at, at, I spoke in the stadium at Philippi. And uh, when I was in the stadium at Ephesus, I did a sound check. And I said, can I get a sound check? And you can hear me to the top. 30,000 people. About that loud. The acoustics were incredible. Built into the side of a mountain. I think that's Athens. Yep. On the way to Mars Hill, there's the inscription of Paul's. You know, this is what's cool about it. What would Mars Hill be without Paul? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. And so there's the inscription of Paul's. Uh, in, in Greek, there's Paul's address to the Athenians. And it's just a bunch of tourists going around taking pictures on a rock because it doesn't mean anything to them. But it meant a lot to me. That's Mars Hill. That's the picture I showed in Sunday school this morning. One of those. There are, of course, down below, there's a marketplace down below that. We didn't even explore that. It's not even fully excavated for whatever reason. squinting people. This is where the games are held, and I want to say this stadium's like, uh, is this 2,000 years old, Melissa? They still use it. They run races and things, and they used to, they used to, this is downtown Athens, they used to flood it and have battle, uh, sea battles and stuff in it as well, back in the day. Uh, they really had some high-end entertainment. I mean, when it came to entertainment, uh, the Greeks and the Romans Believed in entertainment. Let me rush to Philippi. Let's get through Athens. These are just buildings out in the middle of Athens as we're driving through on the bus. I was tired. I was tired of seeing temples. These are some wonderful people that we met. This guy, they live in Nebraska, and there's a pastor from up in uh, Indiana. We had we're just the most wonderful people on our tour, and uh, just you know really became a group as you went, and really made you feel like you're at home with your group. Uh, this, these are like, uh, you know, gas station food. Heroes. Yeah, better than that. A lot of those are... Yeah. There's a Lego man. Unless he's feeding him, sharing coke with a Lego man. It's probably for my nephew. I don't know what that said. Uh, thieves. Thieves is uh, where that's at. And I can't remember what that is, but hey, I'll have to look it up later. There's something significant about it. I wrote a note on it on my phone so I can remember. <laughs> Uh, this is a really pretty lake on the way to Philippi. And Epiphilus is on the way, and a number of the places that Paul mentioned. We kind of just shot pictures as we went along on the highway. I, I mentioned this morning sheep, and a lot of sheep and shepherds out on the hills on the way to Philippi. And uh, it's interesting, I guess it just impressed me because I don't see it that much anymore. It's impressive how much sheep need a shepherd. And uh, of course, the message this morning in the service. Uh, again, the chamomile, chamomile everywhere, and poppies growing. 
and the, 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 the screen just doesn't do it. It just doesn't make it pop like it does an actual person, but it's very, very vivid, and very, very beautiful. On the way to Philippi, there's a, I was tired of riding the bus, so I got up and took scenic pictures. <laughs> Oh, this is Meteor. This is Meteor. This is the, the uh, that's the largest uh, motion picture projector I've seen. So uh, some some movie, uh, uh, James Bond movie, I think was shot around here somewhere. Projector or camera? I believe that's a projector. It is. Yeah. Well, see, you know, but I could be wrong yeah. about it. They didn't tell us the story. This is a hotel we stayed in. It looks nicer than it was. If it had air conditioning, it would have been better. <laughs> or the air conditioners to turn on. They said, no, not this time of year, you don't get air conditioning. Uh, pretty cool and roses everywhere. Roses could have been that hot. couldn't have been that hot, was it? Uh, it's a really neat it was, it was uncomfortable. Uh, these, these mountains are pretty high. Of course, they build monasteries up in the rocks. And uh, the picture I showed you guys this morning, see the jetting, it kind of reminds me of uh, uh, South Dakota, uh, in the Badlands, or in the, in the uh, but, they're, but they're taller than that, but kind of, kind of the same region as like South Dakota and at the top of these rocks they built they climb up built monasteries back before uh, the war they would go people would retreat there and just try to get away from the Ottomans from the Turks and then the <laughs> and then the Orthodox Orthodoxy went and took it over and put monasteries on them. so you can see I mean there's cable cars going to some of them and you can't see scale. We're really up there. This is really high. Uh, again, pictures just can't do it. Uh, but you felt like you're going to fall off of something, and they would have let you. They made the ladies all put skirts on to go into the mon into the nunnery, the monastery. Um, so we took pictures of them. <laughs> this is that room where they have the skull of Stephen in the in the worship center there, you know. And it's just incredible how pagan orthodoxy is and how, how mixed with uh, mythology it is. How you venerate venerate the bones of saints. It's just incredible. Uh, again, it's a picture of the, the town meteor down below it. Kind of a pretty place. We need to get out of here so we can go to Philippi. Thessalonica is next. A lot of dots and trucks, the unibodies, so you got to get a picture of those. <laughs> I tried to take a picture of a poppy because they're so beautiful, but you just can't. The, the, the camera cannot, they shimmer too much. And the camera just can't focus on them the way they displace light. They're very pretty. So I think that's Flanders Field there, probably. A uh, gas station car. That's a 58. Mercury. Was it 58? Poppies. Hand meal. Dogs. Everywhere. They belong to everybody. This is the restaurant where... I believe this is the restaurant where... Um, oh, it's we're on the way to Berea here. This is Paul. Berea is one of the places that got stoned, right? Berea is, you know, where they were more noble than the folks at Thessaloniki. Yeah. And they're probably underneath this shrine is something where Paul actually was, but they ruined it. <laughs> this is Thessalonica, the port. Thessalonica, there's nothing to see there uh, because it's all under the city is still there, still millions of people. Uh, it's a very, very heavily populated city. And, uh, but I just reminded when I went to Thessalonica about Paul being there three Sabbath days and the church being established and his sending to hear how they're doing and hearing about their faith and they were examples in all of Macedonia. Of course, this region we're in here now is where Paul saw a vision, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so Thessalonica would have been that region. Philippi as well would be in that region of Macedonia. So pretty pretty neat place, but as far as things to see, there are ancient treasures jutting out of the water 
I went walking in the evening. Oh, this is for uh, Brother Chris. He used to be here as a red elephant. Sure, uh, big elephant. Fort <laughs> that's left over. It used to be at a fort all along the waterfront of Thessalonica. Uh, this is just Thessalonica, and pictures from the bus. When you're in a bus and you're cramped, you're cooped up, you just start taking pictures of things. Something to amuse yourself with. This is the wharf. Pretty place. Very rough water. I thought, man, it must have been rough for Paul coming in here some days. But the morning we left, it was calm. It was a sea like glass. But sorry, I'll, I'll try to blast through these. We need to go to Philippi. Cheese factories. Cheese factories. Oh, yes. Okay, so everywhere we were in Greece, tour guide being a very, very proud Grecian, uh, everywhere we went, there are these empty houses just everywhere. And for whatever reason, the windows and the doors are missing from the houses. And I don't know why, if, if that's so that squatters don't live in them, but they, they raised the taxes, property taxes, so much that the tour guide said in, in Greece that all of the educated people have left, the doctors and the lawyers and anybody who has a, is educated, they've left. And so now they've, they've really lost the best of their population as a result of that. But I asked the tour guide, I said, why do they take the windows? Any time you go through, there's just you know, nice buildings, but they have the windows out. And she said, well, they're under construction. And they weren't under construction. They were old buildings. And uh, so I asked her again, because everybody's asking, and I was like the mouthpiece for the party. Everybody was afraid to ask. So I was the one that got her mad, you know. And uh, we were going by. I said, like, that house there. She says, oh, that's an old cheese factory, whatever. So everywhere we went, we had a kind of a cut-up guy besides me, you know. And every time you saw a building without windows, cheese factory, cheese factory, no cheese factory. <laughs> so the poor tour guide had to hear Everybody chuckling, making jokes about the types of cheese, you know, in each of the factories and so forth. But cheese factory, cheese factory, cheese factory. Uh, stupid Americans. <laughs> Some more ancient buildings in the middle of Thessalonica. Athens, Thessalonica, anywhere. You can be driving downtown Athens, and there's like a crack in the sidewalk. Orange tree growing out of, out of it with just... You just wouldn't believe how many oranges on it. Just big, just just amazingly fertile country. It's incredible. And it's just, you know, you couldn't get it to grow anywhere else. And it's growing in a crack in the sidewalk there. And uh, figs and all those things. Olive trees everywhere. More poppies. Pictures don't do justice. They're very, very vivid, very pretty. The countryside was very green, springtime. Uh, I think those are orange groves there. Ampiphilus. Scripture doesn't say much more than Paul went there, you know. We're on our way to Philippi. It took several hours. It's quite a long ride. And we, you know, we actually were okay. <laughs> this is this is where uh, this is where Paul baptized Lydia. Not really, but it's where the Orthodox Church put a chapel and called Lydia's Chapel and so forth. But these stones here are cool because those are part of the original Roman road. <clears throat> going right along the river there. And so that is the river that Paul would have gone down and met the, the women. And the Lady Lydia who said, you know, if you found me to be faithful, come dwell with me. So this is out right out, about a mile from Philippi. And I, I suspect because it was a mile from Philippi, it wasn't where Paul baptized Lydia. But uh, they put a nice baptismal there. I don't know if I got a picture of it or not. Uh, somebody was being baptized there when we were there. That's the river. I was, there it is. There's the baptismal. And uh, that was built in 1948, so that's where Paul baptized Lydia. <laughs> Philippi. Literally, that's like they tell you, this is where Paul baptized Lydia. And then you, well, when they built this, 1948. <laughs> There's a poppy. I tried so hard to get a pretty picture of a poppy, and I just couldn't do it. There's where Paul was jailed. Maybe. Probably so. It was a building next to a government building. Philippi is largely unexcavated uh, because they don't have enough American sponsors yet, I think. But I would recommend if you'd like to sponsor Philippi, I mean, it would just be an incredible thing. It's all there, unexcavated. Isn't that incredible? Uh, I can't remember what the, that's Paul. Paul. Paul was in prison there. We'll take Charlie, he can dig. They restored it after the earthquake. <laughs> after Paul's earthquake, remember? Uh -huh. So that's probably, that's probably not where Paul was. 
<laughs> our tour guide was getting up there and they're not so energetic. This is the marketplace and this is the main part of Philippi. And we can walk down there and just mill around, do whatever you want. These stones are all numbered. So they could probably reconstruct the buildings, you know, by the shapes of them. Uh, it's all there. But she said, yeah, there's probably snakes down there. And so we passed by and everybody in our group thought we would come back there and look through it. Now we walked right out the gate on the other end. But I ran down there and took some pictures ahead of time. And I'm glad I did because otherwise, that's the Roman road right there. See that road? Those uh, pavers right down at the bottom there? Yeah. And they're huge. I mean, scale-wise, the, the Roman road, the rocks are like this. So when I think of a Roman road, I always thought like of cobblestones. Yeah. But this is still a pretty nice road. See how flat they carved the stones and put, I mean, it, you could really move down a Roman road. Like, you know, they they were flat and they, I mean, they were, if you look at just how square and well laid it originally would have been, I mean, it's a couple thousand years old uh, and still pretty impressive. And further down, there used to be a real nice section of the Roman road there at Philippi, but the tourists kept stopping and taking pictures so they covered it up. <laughs> I don't know if that gives you any insight or not. I love the Grecians. The city would have gone all the way up the hill. A lot of the construction was later. She spent a lot of time, our tour guide here, she was an Orthodox. Uh, she was Orthodox and she spent a lot of time showing us Catholic construction, and I didn't find it to be very interesting. I would rather have gone down the marketplace to the old area. She showed us the different columns and pillars from different churches that had been constructed there. It didn't signify much to me. Took some pictures, and it was pretty incredible to carve that kind of thing in a rock, you know, in the day. I'm pretty sure they didn't have CNC machinery. Bases of pillars, they're all there. They could be, re they could be, uh, uh, reconstructed pretty easily. That's still up. Philippi was one of the three cities that we went to that is largely original. It's all there. And, uh, you know, again, I don't think it's 5% excavated. Corinth was 5% excavated. Philippi is probably 1%. It's just there, what you see. And you can see the marketplace there. And the flat area down on the right where, you know, where people have done business. Every, every place had a square big square where all the townspeople have gone and met together. Snake or something. Here we go. This is the stadium at Philippi. Paul would have been there. He would have gone there. And uh, they, they unearthed uh, lion bones and so forth uh, in the pit underneath it. And so this would have been one of those areas where the this is of course the theater and in uh, the Greek mythology in the Roman world, theater and idolatry were very, very closely mixed. All of the theatrical plays had a moral, had a, a moral to them, and uh, most of them had a religious overtone. And so, when Rome became Christian, at first there was no theater, and then they had the first theater was. Uh, I can't remember what the plays were. They still exist today, but uh, then it came back in the church. The church put on the plays, and by that I mean the Catholic Church. And uh, of course, it was religious then as well. A uh, little bit of uh, studying the theater in Greek uh, gives you a little bit of an understanding. Um, I've read Christian authors in the 1800s that railed against the theater. Growing up, I always saw what's so terrible about theater. Other than the fact that I don't want to be part of a play and I got forced to a few times. What's so terrible about theater? But uh, uh, the religious aspect of it is very, very religious to the people. It was locked in their culture and their, their culture and their religion, their government, who they were as a people, was identified and portrayed in theater. And so... Um, Christians ought to think twice. You just ought to, ought to be you ought to be thinking people about 
Theater can be good, but you've got to make sure that you don't have the roots of where it's at. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, today we don't have theater so much as we have Hollywood. But every movie has a moral lesson. Or I could say an immoral lesson, as the case may be. And Christians ought to be circumspect about that. And it's one of the things as I sat here at Philippi, one of the thoughts that ran through my mind. And I got to preach. Uh, the people in our group, they sat up here, and I got to preach... Uh, about uh, really the theme of Philippians and uh, had a nice time and I think Melissa might have recorded on video or somebody did but it doesn't really matter much um, it was neat to be at Philippi a suffering church where Paul wrote to them and told them how to think about the things which had happened to him that they'd fallen out rather into the furtherance of the gospel now you think about the church getting established at Philippi well, when church was established at Philippi, Paul and Silas were locked in prison there. Mm -hmm. And the experience that Paul had in Philippi was persecution. He was escorted out by the, by the magistrates, by the leaders. Remember, because he said, hey, they've beaten us openly and uncondemned, being Romans. Let them fetch us out. And uh, so he was escorted out of the city. And uh, so, pretty neat place. There's some of the folks sitting down getting ready for a message. And then we left. We said, whoa, is that over? I <laughs> uh, went down to Amphipolis and had uh, swordfish for lunch. Kusadasi, outside of Ephesus, nice cafes, Turkish food. Using Turkish lira, Melissa and I had uh, some pretty nice food uh, with Cokes, nice little, some kind of Turkish pizzas. And uh, the equivalent cost in the tourist cafe for it uh, was about $8.50 U.S. for the two of us in a nice place to eat. Pretty nice food. <laughs> Pretty good food. I could eat in Turkey for quite a while. Their food was... The, the Turkish food, don't tell the Greeks, but uh, very similar to Greek food, but maybe a little bit better. And uh, very, very good. As well as the, uh, the Greek food was pretty fantastic as well. But uh, we had a nice time. There was a lot of things that I can't share, a lot of pictures I don't have time to share with you. But overall, I wanted to just kind of give you the overview of some of the thoughts that we had as we passed through. Again, in uh, conclusion, Ephesus, Corinth, Philippi, places where a great church was established, no symbols. No symbols. The effect of the church is evident because of the conquering of the church by Romanism, by the Roman Catholicism in 300. Of course, the church had so overspread this region of the country that Constantine saw fit to hijack it and use it as a political means to conquer the world so that the church didn't have to wipe out his population because every time you killed a believer, ten would rise up in their place. And I just loved it that we went through Ephesus, and indeed, Artemis' temple had been torn down, but there hadn't been any edifice to replace it. As a Christian, we need to be careful about shrines and about uh, marks and memories. I, I thought it was nice from a community standpoint to see Erastus Memorial outside of the stadium. But I'm glad I didn't see it on a church building. Saint Erastus. All believers are saints. And uh, there's a tendency in us to worship an object or venerate an object rather than Jesus Christ. And we always have to remember that we serve a living God. That Christ lives in us. And uh, He doesn't dwell in a temple made with hands. I'm reminded about the Samaritan woman who much like these people here would have said, our fathers worship in this mountain. And Jesus said, believe me. The time is going to come that you don't worship at Jerusalem or in the mountain. And that's the time in which we live. And as we saw these places, and of course when you could get time alone and reflect, 
some of the thoughts I thought was, I wish I could have my church here. I wish I could have the, my saints, my believers, my people here. And perhaps we'll do a trip like this sometime with a good guide and have the time to uh, reflect and read the scripture and really have a meaningful experience minus the shrines. I'll be honest with you, the shrines just don't do anything for me at all. And I'm told that Israel's worse. When you go there, they put shrines on everything. Yep. And uh, I'm just reminded what distinguishes a Christian, a believer, is Christ in us. It's Jesus Christ living in us. And it was so neat to have that connection with other believers from all over the world in some cases, but mostly from the United States. Matter of fact, all the tourists visiting these sites were primarily from the United States. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about Acts chapter 1. But ye uh, shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. And I thought, uttermost part of the earth. I thought, you know, the people in the uttermost need to get back to the regions surrounding the original areas because that's where the gospel is and where we don't really have the shrines and the religion so much, but we have more of Christ living in us. It'd be nice to get back to that and to see that again. I also thought uh, with great empathy toward the ministers of the gospel in those regions where you're dealing with an organized religion which is required in every person's taxes. And where they say, they, you get this many churches in your city. What are you talking about? You want to buy a parcel of land and put a church there. The government put the church there already. What's wrong with it? Oh, you want to get buried? You don't, you're not part of this church? Nothing doing. You can't have a burial outside of orthodoxy. And then the racket it is, the burden that the religion places on the people really is Laodicean in that sense because... If you're Orthodox, you pay to have your loved one's body put into a box. It's there for four years, and then after that, you have to come and retrieve it, and you have to pay again to move it somewhere else. And then after that, you have to uh, pay to have it interred or keep it with yourself. And it's big money in the Orthodox Church. It's a fundraiser for them. And, of course, it's a set fee, and nobody's exempt. If... Uh, a person leaves the church, their family, of course, is shamefully treated, and uh, it's the tour guide is not meaning anything slight against orthodoxy because she was very devout orthodox. Talked about a lady who uh, had committed suicide. If you commit suicide, you can't have a funeral. And her family showed up for her funeral, and then they called it off while they were there. So now. When there's a suicide, they kind of sweep it under the carpet. They make sure not to call it that so they can be buried. And I just thought, you know, for every law, there's always a counter measure to get around the law. For every rule, there's a way to get around the rule. And that's religion. That's what religion does. That's a wonderful thing to be free from the law and not under it. Is that, the, is that what you'd call the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and rulers over the people? Well, that's, that's what I was alluding to, and that's many ways that the religion... Of course, Catholicism is Nicolaitan. Yeah. Now, you know, uh, over the language argument, Orthodoxy, Russian, Egyptian, Coptic, the different types of Orthodox, uh, you know, they have a disagreement, but they're the same. Uh, they make a big difference between the icons and the actual images. Orthodox, we do icons. The Catholic Church does images. It looks pretty much the same to me mm -hmm. as far as, you know, people going in and kissing it, bowing to it, and worshiping it, praying to it. It's pretty much the same to me. It's idolatry. So, well, let's dismiss with prayer. Father, thank you for the time that we've had this evening. And Lord, for the opportunity to go places and be inspired by saints who served you. And Lord, literally see the places where Luke and Aristarchus and Titus and Paul and John, believers who served you faithfully were. Lord, I just pray that you would just give us a perspective to it. We thank you so much uh, for the experience we've even had in, in reminiscing over it this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.